Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter C. Brown, Henry L. Rodiger III, Mark A. McDaniel by the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, London, England, 2014. Preface. People generally are going about learning in the wrong ways. Empirical research into how we learn and remember shows that much of what we take for gospel about how to learn turns out to be largely wasted effort. Even college and medical students, whose main job is learning, rely on study techniques that are far from optimal. At the same time, this field of research, which goes back 125 years, but has been particularly fruitful in recent years, has yielded a body of insights that constitute a growing science of learning. Highly effective, evidence-based strategies to replace less effective but widely accepted practices that are rooted in theory, lore, and intuition. But there's a catch. The most effective learning strategies are not intuitive. Two of us, Henry Rodiger and Mark McDaniel, are cognitive scientists who have dedicated our careers to the study of learning and memory. Peter Brown is a storyteller. We have a team up to explain how learning and memory work, and we do this less by reciting the research than by telling stories of people who have found their way to mastery of complex knowledge and skills. Through these examples, we illuminate the principles of learning that the research shows are highly effective. This book arose in part from a collaboration among 11 cognitive psychologists. In 2002, the James S. McDonnell Foundation of St. Louis, Missouri, in an effort to better bridge the gap between basic knowledge on learning in cognitive psychology and its application in education, awarded a research grant applying cognitive psychology to enhance educational practice to Rodiger and McDaniel and nine others. With Rodiger as a principal investigator, the team collaborated for 10 years on research to translate cognitive science into educational science. And in many respects, this book is a direct result of that work. The researchers in many of their studies are cited in the book. The notes and our acknowledgments Rodiger's and McDaniel's work is also supported by several other funders, and McDaniel is the co-director of Washington University Center for Integrative Research in Learning and Memory. Most books deal with topics serially. They cover one topic, move on to the next, and so on. We follow this strategy in the sense that each chapter addresses new topics but we also apply two of the primary learning principles in the book, spaced repetition of key ideas and the interleaving of different but related topics. If learners spread out their study of a topic, returning it to periodically over time, they remember it better. Similarly, if they interleave the study of different topics, they learn each better than if they had studied them one at a time in sequence. Thus, we unbashedly cover key ideas more than once, repeating principles in different contexts across the book. The reader will remember them better and use them more effectively as a result. This is a book about what people can do for themselves right now in order to learn better and remember longer. The responsibility for learning rests with every individual. Teachers and coaches, too, can be more effectively right now by helping students understand these principles and by designing them into the learning experience. This is not a book about how education policy or the school system ought to be reformed. Clearly, though there are policy implications, for example, college professors at the forefront of applying these strategies in the classroom have experimented with their potential for narrowing the achievement gap in the sciences. And the results of these studies are eye-opening. We write for students and teachers, of course, 
and for all readers for whom effective learning is high priority. For trainers in business, industry, and the military, for leaders of professional associations, offering in-service training to their members, and for coaches. We also write for lifelong learners nearing middle age or older who want to hone their skills so as to stay in the game. While much remains to be known about learning and its neural underpinnings, a large body of research has yielded principles and practical strategies that can be put to work immediately, at no cost and to great effect. Chapter 1. Learning is Misunderstood Early in his career as a pilot, Matt Brown was flying a twin-engine Cessna Northeast out of Harlingen, Texas, when he noticed a drop in oil pressure in his right engine. He was alone, flying through the night at 11,000 feet, making a hotshot freight run to a plant in Kentucky that had shut down its manufacturing line awaiting product parts for assembly. He reduced altitude and kept an eye on the oil gauge hoping to fly as far as planned fuel stop in Louisiana, where he could service the plane. But the pressure kept falling. Matt has been messing around with piston engines since he was old enough to hold a wrench, and he knew he had a problem. He ran a mental checklist figuring his options. If he let the oil pressure get too low, he risked the engine seizing up. How much further could he fly before shutting it down? What would happen when he did? He'd lose lift on the right side, but could he stay aloft? He reviewed the tolerances he'd memorized from the Cessna 401. Loaded, the best you could do on one engine was slow your descent. But he had a light load and had burned through most of his fuel. So he shut down the ailing right engine. Fetter the prop to reduce drag, increased power on the left, flew with opposite rudder, and limped another 10 miles toward his intended stop. There, he made his approach in a wide left-hand turn. For the simple but critical reason that without power on his right side, it was only from a left-hand turn that he still had the lift needed to level out for a touchdown. While we don't need to understand each of the actions Matt took, he certainly needed to, and his ability to work himself out of a jam illustrates what we mean in this book when we talk about learning. We mean acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. There are some immutable aspects of learning that we can probably all agree on. First, to be useful, learning requires memory, so what we've learned is still there later when we need it. Second, we need to keep learning and remembering all our lives. We can't advance through middle school without some mastery of language, arts, math, science, and social studies. Getting ahead at work takes mastery of job skills and difficult colleagues. In retirement, we pick up new winters. In our dotage, we move into simpler housing while we're still able to adapt. If you're good at learning, you have an advantage in life. Third, learning is an acquired skill, and the most effective strategies are often counterintuitive. Claims we make in this book. You may not agree with the last point, but we hope to persuade you of it. Here, more or less unadorned in list form, are some of the principal claims we make in support of our argument. We set them forth more fully in the chapters that follow. Learning is deeper and more durable when it's effortful. Learning that's easy is like writing in sand. Here today and gone tomorrow. We are poor judges of when we are learning well and when we're not. When the going is harder and slower, and it doesn't feel productive, we are drawn to strategies that feel more fruitful. Unaware that the gains from these strategies are often temporary. 
Rereading text and math practice of a skill or new knowledge are by far the preferred study strategies of learners of all stripes, but they're also among the least productive. By math practice, we mean the single-minded, rapid-fire repetition of something you're trying to burn into memory. The practice, practice, practice of conventional wisdom. Cramming for exams is an example. Rereading and mass practice give rise to feelings of fluency that are taken to be signs of mastery. But for true mastery, our durability of these strategies are largely a waste of time. Retrieval practice, recalling facts or concepts or events from memory, is a more effective learning strategy than review by rereading. Flashcards are a simple example. Retrieval strengthens the memory and interrupts forgetting. A single, simple quiz after reading a text or hearing a lecture produces better learning and remembering than rereading the text or reviewing lecture notes. While the brain is not a muscle that gets stronger with exercise, the neural pathways that make up a body of learning do get stronger when the memory is retrieved and the learning is practiced. Periodic practice arrests forgetting, strengthens retrieval routes, and is essential for hanging onto the knowledge you want to gain. When you space out practice at a task and get a little rusty between sessions, or you interleave the practice of two or more subjects, retrieval is harder and feels less productive but the effort produces longer lasting learning and enables more versatile application of it in later settings. Trying to solve a problem before being taught the solution leads to better learning, even when errors are made in the attempt. The popular notion that you learn better when you receive instruction in a form consistent with your preferred learning style, for example, as an auditory or visual learner, is not supported by the empirical research. People do have multiple forms of intelligence to bring to bear on learning, and you learn better when you go wide, drawing on all your aptitudes and resourcefulness than when you limit instruction or experience to the style you find most amenable. When you're adept at extracting the underlying principles or rules, that differentiate types of problems, you're more successful at picking the right solutions in unfamiliar situations. This skill is better acquired through interleaved and varied practice than mass practice. For instance, interleaving practice at computing the volumes of different kinds of geometric solids makes you more skilled at picking the right solution when a later test presents a random solid. Interleaving the identification of bird types or the works of oil painters improves your ability both to learn the unifying attributes within a type and to differentiate between types, improving your skill at categorizing new specimens you encounter later. We're all susceptible to illusions that can hijack our judgment of what we know and can do. Testing helps calibrate our judgments of what we've learned. A pilot who is responding to a failure of hydraulic systems in a flight simulator discovers quickly whether he's on top of the corrective procedures or not. In virtually all areas of learning, you build better mastery when you use testing as a tool to identify and bring up your areas of weakness. All new learning requires a foundation of prior knowledge. You need to know how to land a twin engine plane on two engines before you can learn to land it on one. To learn trigonometry, you need to remember your algebra and geometry. To learn cabinet making, you need to have mastered the properties of wood and composite materials. How to join boards, cut rabbits, route edges, and miter corners. In a cartoon by the far side cartoonist Gary Larson, a bug-eyed school kid asks his teacher, Mr. Osborne, can I be excused? My brain is full. 
if you're just engaging in mechanical repetition, it's true. You quickly hit the limit of what you can keep in mind. However, if you practice elaboration, there's no limit to how much you can learn. Elaboration is the process of giving new material meaning by expressing it in your own words and connecting it with what you already know. The more you can explain about the way your new learning relates to your prior knowledge, the stronger your grasp of the new learning will be, and the more connections you create that will help you remember it later. Warm air can hold more moisture than cold air. To know that, this is true in your own experience. You can think of the drip of water from the back of an air conditioner, or the way a stifling summer day turns cooler out the backside of a sudden thunderstorm. Evaporation has a cooling effect. You know this because a humid day at your uncle's in Atlanta feels hotter than a dry one at your cousin's in Phoenix, where your sweat disappears even before your skin feels damp. When you study the principles of heat transfer, you understand conduction from warming your hands around a hot cup of cocoa, radiation from the way the sun pools in the den on a wintry day, convection from the life-saving blast of AC as your uncle squires you slowly through his favorite back alley, haunts of Atlanta. Putting new knowledge into a larger context helps learning. For example, the more of the unfolding story of history you know, the more of it you can learn. And the more ways you can give that story meaning, say by connecting it to your understanding of human ambition and the untidiness of fate, the better the story stays with you. Likewise, if you're trying to learn an abstraction, like the principle of angular momentum, it's easier when you ground it in something concrete that you already know, like the way a figure skater's rotation speeds up as she draws her arms to her chest. People who learn to extract the key ideas from new material and organize them into a mental model and connect that model to prior knowledge show an advantage in learning complex mastery. A mental model is a mental representation of some external reality. Think of a baseball batter waiting for a pitch. He has less than an instant to decipher whether it's a curveball, a change up, or something else. How does he do it? There are a few subtle signals that help. The way the pitcher winds up, the way he throws, the spin of the ball seems. A great batter winos out of all the extraneous perceptual distractions, seeing only these variations in pitches. And through practice, he forms distinct mental models based on a different set of cues for each kind of pitch. He connects these models to what he knows about batting stance, strike zone, and swinging so as to stay on top of the ball. These he connects to mental models of player positions. If he's got guys on first and second, maybe he'll sacrifice to move the runners ahead. If he's got men on first and third, and there is one out, he's got to keep from hitting into a double play while still hitting to score the runner. His mental models of player positions connect to his models of the opposition. Are they playing deep or shallow? And to the signals flying around from the dugout, the base coaches to him. In a great at bat, all these pieces come together seamlessly. The batter connects with the ball and drives it through a hole in the outfield buying the time to get on first and advance his men. Because he has called out all but the most important elements for identifying and responding to each kind of pitch. Constructed mental models out of that learning and connected those models to his mastery of other essential elements of this complex game. An expert player has a better chance of scoring runs than a less experienced one who cannot make sense of the vast and changeable information he faces every time he steps out to the plate. Many people believe that their intellectual ability is hardwired from birth. 
and that failure to meet a learning challenge is an indictment of their native ability. But every time you learn something new, you change the brain. The residue of your experiences is stored. It's true that we start life with the gift of our genes. But it's also true that we become capable through the learning and development of mental models that enable us to reason, solve, and create. In other words, the elements that shape your intellectual abilities lie to a surprising extent within your own control. Understanding that this is so enables you to see failure as a badge of effort and a source of useful information the need to dig deeper, or to try a different strategy. The need to understand that when learning is hard, you're doing important work. To understand that striving and setbacks, as in any action video game or new BMX bike stunt, are essential if you are to surpass your current level of performance toward true expertise. Making mistakes, and correcting them builds the bridges to advanced learning. Empirical evidence versus theory, lore, and intuition. Much of how we structure training and schooling is based on learning theories that have been handed down to us, and these are shaped by our own sense of what works. A sensibility drawn from our personal experiences as teachers, coaches, students, and mere humans at large on Earth. How we teach and study is largely a mix of theory, lore, and intuition. But over the last 40 years and more, cognitive psychologists have been working to build a body of evidence to clarify what works and to discover the strategies that get results. Cognitive psychology is the basic science of understanding how the mind works, conducting empirical research into how people perceive, remember, and think. Many others have their hands in the puzzle of learning as well. Developmental and educational psychologists are concerned with theories of human development and how they can be used to shape the tools of education, such as testing regimes, instructional organizers, for example, topic outlines and schematic illustrations, and resources for special groups like those in remedial and gifted education. Neuroscientists, using new Im imaging techniques and other tools, are advancing our understanding of brain mechanisms that underlie learning, but we're still a very long way from knowing what neuroscience will tell us about how to improve education. How is one to know whose advice to take on how best to go about learning? It's wise to be skeptical. Advice is easy to find only a few mouse clicks away. Yet not all advice is grounded in research, far from it. Nor does all that passes as research meet the standards of science, such as having appropriate control conditions to assure that the results of an investigation are objective and generalizable. The best empirical studies are experimental in nature. The researcher develops a hypothesis and then tests it through a set of experiments that must meet rigorous criteria for design and objectivity. In the chapters that follow, we have distilled the findings of a large body of such studies that have stood up under review by the scientific community before being published in professional journals. We are collaborators in some of these studies, but not the lion's share, where we're offering theory rather than scientifically validated results, if we say so. To make our points we use in addition to tested science, anecdotes from people like Matt Brown, whose work requires mastery of complex knowledge and skills, stories that illustrate the underlying principles of how we learn and remember. Discussion of the research studies themselves is kept to a minimum, but you will find many of them cited in the notes at the end of the book if you care to dig further. People misunderstand learning. It turns out that much of what we've been doing as teachers and students isn't serving us well, but some comparatively simple changes could make a big difference. People commonly believe that if you expose yourself to something enough, 
times, say a textbook passage or a set of terms from an 8th grade biology class, you can burn it into memory. Not so. Many teachers believe that if they can make learning easier and faster, the learning will be better. Much research turns this belief on its head. When learning is harder, it's stronger and lasts longer. It's widely believed by teachers, trainers, and coaches that the most effective way to master a new skill is to give it dog, single-minded focus, practicing over and over until you've got it down.